You're listening to the fourth season of Breakdown, an exclusive podcast of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. This season, Murder Below the Nat Line. For photos and additional information, please go to ajc.com slash breakdown. Follow us on Twitter at AJC Courts and at AJC Breakdown. Bob Ellis made mistakes, but the mistakes Bob made were between him and his wife and his God. Bob committed no crime. Could Hercules Brown be a co-defendant? Absolutely. That would not shock my sensibilities. But did I know that at the time? Absolutely not. All the defense had to have was reasonable doubt. And that mask with Mr. Brown's DNA in it is reasonable doubt. That's the definition of reasonable doubt. Hi, I'm Bill Rankin legal affairs reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Welcome back to Breakdown. I've mentioned the name Donna Brown dozens of times in this podcast, but I've never been able to tell you much about who she was, other than the victim in this awful murder case. In decades of covering criminal justice, that's something that has always troubled me. The killer generally gets a lot more attention than the person he killed. That's in part because the cops and the press are trying to learn as much as they can about the killer. But murder should be every bit as much about the dead as about the living. So I've been concerned that I couldn't tell you more about Donna Brown. We knew she was the night manager at the Taco Bell in Adel. She was shot to death and robbed in the restaurant's parking lot in the middle of the night. She was a 40-year-old single mom. In the first five episodes, This has very much been a story about finding justice for Devanya Inman, but we also should seek justice for Donna Brown. I finally caught a break well into the production of this podcast when I tracked down one of Donna's sisters in Florida, LaShonda Ging. She was very simple, knew how to shoot a gun, knew how to cast a fishing pole, just a simple kind of woman, and that's what I remember of my sister. She wasn't, you know, high class, high maintenance. She was... She worked every day. She believed in if you were able to work, you got out and worked for anything that you wanted. Nothing in this world was handed to us. A lot of years separated the two. Donna was the product of her mother's first marriage. LaShonda came from her second marriage. But they were close. Donna had worked at a Hardee's in a neighboring county before she came to work at the Taco Bell in Adel. She had a seven-year-old son who was all her own. She was artificially inseminated, um... So there was no father after she lost her uh, ex-husband. She didn't really get back into the dating game. She just was herself. She was just, she was quite content with who she was. She named her son Matthew. He was seven years old when his mother was taken from him. And all she lived for in that seven years, and I remember that as well, was Matthew. You know, Matthew, once she had Matthew, that's, that was it, that her life was complete. LaShonda connected me with Patsy Carrington. She was Donna's sister too, but much closer in age, only 14 months apart. Patsy said she considered Donna her best friend. After Patsy moved to Louisiana, she and Donna spoke on the phone every Saturday to catch up. She was a wonderful person and a caring person and a very loving mother, a loving sister. She cared about her family. Her family was very important to her. And it was just devastating to our whole family that she's not here no more because she was the backbone of the family. She was the strong one. She was the one who made sure everything happened. That was, you know, doctor's appointments, take care of my dad, my stepmom. I mean, she just, I mean, that was her life. That's, she lived for that and for that child. She always told me that he was a godsend. You know, God gave her that child. And, I mean, she lived, eat, and slept and worked for that child. That's the kind of person she was. Matthew was her world. I mean, he was like a miracle child. It's sad that um, that somebody that had a heart of gold can be gone in an instant. It's really sad. You know, my best friend's gone. Patsy said Matthew is now grown and serving in the military with children of his own. My sister is missing out on those grandbabies, and she would love to be 
she would be the best grandmother, but she didn't get a chance for that. We'll hear more from Donna Brown's sisters later in this episode. At the end of episode five, Judge Buster McConnell had heard all the testimony and received all the evidence from Devanya Inman's extraordinary motion for a new trial. As I told you before, McConnell seemed to have fallen into Inman's camp. Amy Maxwell, former executive director of the Georgia Innocence Project, saw it the same way. Cautiously optimistic. I thought it went pretty well. I think that the bottom line for me was always, no matter what any witness says, you have the evidence from the alternate suspect. McConnell announced his decision in an email sent to both sides on April 1st, 2014. Unfortunately for Inman, this was no April Fool's joke. The email, addressed to the prosecutor and copied to the defense, reads, Please prepare an order denying the motion. It certainly is an interesting case, but the new evidence by no means exonerates Mr. Inman. It does show that Mr. Brown may have been an accomplice and maybe should be charged and tried, but it does not show that Mr. Inman was not a participant. It is a very close case, and I would not be surprised if my order is overturned. It is that close. I probably can't even say the things I thought. But um, I just remember being devastated, honest to God, just thinking, really, you don't have the courage to say, you know what, we didn't get it right. Maybe we got the right guy. Maybe we did, but we didn't do it the right way. And there's enough here that we could open this up again. And then, of course, the comment that I'm probably going to be reversed on appeal was a little like a slap in the face. Well, if you thought you were going to be reversed on appeal, why not err on the side of giving this man a new trial? Why have the possibility that you're leaving an innocent person in prison? If this is such a great case against him, it should hold up in court, right? Legitimately hold up in court. I don't think it would. I I just, I can't imagine it would. McConnell announced his decision on April 1st and his order was entered on October 31st. I don't really think those dates have any significance, but then here's what the Halloween order said. No evidence was presented that would show the defendant did not commit the murder other than the argument of defendant that the DNA found on the mask served to exonerate him of the crime of murder. The court would note that no eyewitness testimony was presented at the trial that anyone was seen wearing a mask at the scene of the murder or the location where the car was found. While the court recognizes that the DNA on the mask is not irrelevant, it is not so material that it would probably produce a different result. The court cannot find that a new trial should be granted The court would credit the evidence presented at trial in this finding. If the evidence presented at trial is to be believed, then it suggests there were other persons involved in the murder, either as co-conspirators or parties to the crime. Okay, hold it right there. If the evidence presented at trial is to be believed, seriously? Almost none of the evidence presented at trial is to be believed. Three people, including the state's star witness, Kwame Spaulding, recanted their incriminating statements. And the judge himself said he doubted the testimony of a fourth key witness, Virginia Tatum. So how could the court credit the evidence presented at trial? Of course you remember, at trial, the defense twice tried to introduce hearsay testimony that Hercules Brown confessed to the killing at Taco Bell. But the DA declared that, quote, there is not one scintilla of evidence, unquote, that Hercules was involved in Donna Brown's killing. Judge McConnell refused to admit the witness's testimony, saying they couldn't be trusted. Then he said, and I quote, if there was any other independent evidence that Mr. Brown committed the offense, then I would have no problem with that. But there was nothing. Now, all these years later, the defense had presented McConnell with precisely what he had asked for, independent evidence of Brown's involvement. But the judge said that still isn't good enough. It changes nothing. That hearsay testimony about Hercules' involvement in Donna Brown's murder still doesn't come in, the judge said. In his order, McConnell concluded, While the new DNA evidence is not inconsequential, it simply does not show that Devanya Inman did not commit the crime for which he was convicted. 
McConnell said he wouldn't be surprised if he were reversed. He said that because he knew his order would be appealed to the Georgia Supreme Court. And it was. Here's Amy Maxwell. I thought that McConnell misinterpreted the law so clearly that there was no way the Georgia Supreme Court was going to not hear the case. Because this is the exact kind of case that the Supreme Court should hear. They could have clarified the law. They could have made it clear what is required for a motion for a new trial when you have DNA evidence. They would have set the, the path in the future. You know, this is how we're going to interpret this law. Here's something you need to know about that appeal. When you're convicted of murder in Georgia, you have an automatic appeal to the state Supreme Court, which the court must hear. Inman had had his automatic appeal years before, and the justices had ruled against him. Now, with the extraordinary motion for a new trial, the appeal is not automatic. It's discretionary. That is, the court can decide whether to hear it or not hear it. And guess what? The Supreme Court of Georgia issued a one-line unanimous ruling on December 19, 2014. The court said it did not wish to hear Inman's appeal. That meant it wasn't going to hear arguments on the case. It wasn't going to issue an opinion. In other words, game over. I just couldn't believe it. And, and of course, it's a one line. It doesn't explain to us why they're not going to hear it. Just, no, nah, we don't want to hear it. Jesus. So that's it. You know, I mean, all I could think was, that's it? He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison? Nobody cares? I felt like, I don't know how I messed this up. How is this man still in prison? Clearly, I screwed this case up because I just can't believe we were not able to persuade, if not the judge. And of course, it was hard to persuade the judge that heard the trial. Although he heard all that crappy evidence, you'd think he was maybe thinking, oh, maybe I, I can have a second shot at justice. But then not to be able to convince the state Supreme Court to hear it, I just feel like, what did we do wrong? What did I do wrong? I don't blame anyone else for this. It's like, what did I do wrong? This case haunts me. Bud Seaman, who represented Inman in his first appeal, has a darker view. I think the real question is, is why won't the courts do something about it after it happens and it's clear that, that a miscarriage of justice has occurred? And I think the answer to that is, is the, the courts just don't care. You can look at what they did in this case, and there are multiple other cases that I could cite as examples to you where a defendant has essentially been proven to have not committed the crime, or at least there's significant new evidence that he has not committed the crime, and the courts just don't care. They don't see their role as letting in innocent people out, uh, out from underneath wrongful convictions. They see their role as processing criminal cases through the system. And a person's guilt or innocence is just doesn't matter to them. It's just not something that concerns them. I remarked to Seaman, rather lamely, that the courts have to care. If, if they cared, they would at least hear these cases. They, they, they don't have to grant relief. They could grant the application, hear the arguments, and then make a decision stating their reasons for, for affirming the conviction. That's what they don't want to do. They don't want to be put in a position where they have to state their reasons to affirm these convictions that are indefensible. And here's another thing to consider. Seaman said if Inman had been sentenced to death, there was likely a better chance the court would have heard his appeal. The court pays close attention to death penalty cases, that is, as it should be. But that doesn't exempt the court from paying close attention to every case that comes before it, Seaman said. But when you've got people convicted of murder and serving life sentences, and the factual basis of the conviction is just completely undermined by reliable scientific evidence, and the court just blows the case off and refuses to even hear the arguments, I don't know how you can square that with a court that's interested in protecting the system from convicting innocent people. 
there's got to be some kind of backstop because we know from the proliferation of cases that have been reversed because of DNA evidence that erroneous convictions, they happen all the time. But it's not a large percentage of the cases, but it's not an uncommon event in our criminal justice system. And there has to be some sort of backstop when cases of clear innocence arise supported by very reliable evidence. In Devania's case, now the state can make the argument, and I think they did in Devania's case, that he could have been a co-defendant. This evidence doesn't mean he didn't participate. Well, that wasn't the evidence at trial. He wasn't tried as a participant. He was tried as the, as the shooter. And the evidence discovered clearly indicates it is very strong evidence. If it doesn't prove his innocence, it's very strong evidence of his innocence, particularly when you factor in Hercules Brown and his record and his character and the crimes that he's committed. When you add that to the DNA evidence, I mean, you know. Maxwell and Seaman are in full-on excoriation of the Georgia Supreme Court. I have to say that I've covered the Georgia court system for 25 years, and I know most of the members of the Georgia Supreme Court. They're good people. They take their jobs and their oaths seriously. But I can't for the life of me understand why they didn't hear this appeal. I just don't get it. I thought the existence of the mask was enough to alter the entire case against Inman, but it seems not to have made much of an impression on Georgia's courts. Judge McConnell said in his order that the mask was not inconsequential. But what consequence did the discovery of the mask really have? None that I can see. So what could explain the presence of the mask? How could it have shown up in the car of a murdered woman with a known killer's DNA on it? And how could that not matter? Do you know what extreme contortions of logic you have to undergo to explain away the mask? Extreme contortion number one. Donna Brown and Hercules Brown, who worked together at the Taco Bell, were friends. And Hercules just absentmindedly left his scary-looking mask in her car. Like you do. Extreme contortion number two. Devanya Inman wore the mask when he committed the robbery and killing. But he made sure to clean it completely, smear Hercules' DNA on it, and then leave it in Donna Brown's car. Brilliant. Extreme contortion number three. Inman tells Hercules he wants to rob the Taco Bell, and Hercules says, hey, why don't you borrow my mask? And Inman does, but he forgets to use it and leaves it on the floorboard of Donna Brown's car. So there you go. No wonder the courts and prosecution thought the mask was meaningless. I'm sure there are more extreme contortions out there, but the prosecution never offered even a plausible contortion. Okay. So there's maybe one more scenario that might actually make sense. Inman and Hercules commit the robbery of Donna Brown together. Before they drive off, Inman sees Hercules' mask on the ground, scoops it up, jumps into Donna Brown's car, and carelessly throws the mask on the floor as he drives away. So that explanation, such as it is, represents exactly one more explanation than the prosecution offered. So why does the state seem to be running away from the alternate suspect theory? That is that Hercules Brown was the killer. Well, it is confounding. Confounding, indeed. That's Barry Sheck, who co-founded the Innocence Project 25 years ago. In our interview, he spoke of cognitive dissonance and tunnel vision among prosecutors. And he spoke of rape cases in which the evidence of innocence was overwhelming. Recently in uh, Chicago, there are two cases uh, involving five teenagers. And in both cases, the DNA showed and they, they got them with guilty pleas and false confessions. And in both cases, the DNA hit to serial offenders. And yet they continued to try to re-prosecute them, even engaging in theories like, what must have happened is that the defendants killed the victim. And then the serial offender had necrophilia, had sex with a dead body. And that's how the semen got there. You could see this happening lots of times. 
DAs at the beginning of the DNA era where they would always come up with what they call unindicted co-ejaculators. They would say, oh, well, the semen is not from the defendant like we claimed the trial, but, you know, there might have been some other consensual partner. Sheck said Inman's case has what police and prosecutors are looking for in every case, objective scientific evidence that corroborates an admission or confession. So if we were starting from scratch and you had somebody that said, oh, Hercules Brown admitted to this. Hercules Brown was asking questions about how to rob the Taco Bell or any other circumstantial evidence implicating him. And then you have probative biological evidence, in this case, the mask that police believe was worn by the perpetrator. And then it doesn't just exclude Inman, right? Um, But it hits Hercules Brown. That's a big deal. All these cases where it seems completely crazy that law enforcement would not acknowledge at least there's new evidence of innocence that creates a reasonable probability of a different outcome, which is pretty much the standard for newly discovered evidence uh, everywhere, and in my recollection is including Georgia. How can you not believe that there's a reasonable chance that a jury might have reached a different verdict? Not saying definitely, but a reasonable chance, given the power of the DNA combined with the admission. Sheck told me he is at a loss as to why prosecutors continue fighting these cases. Sometimes the psychologists will call this sunk costs. People more closely will say, when you're digging a hole, the first rule is stop digging. This is an extremely troubling case. Donna Brown's sisters, LaShonda Ging and Patsy Carrington, told me they had never heard anything about Hercules Brown in the mask. I hated that I was the one who broke that news to them. LaShonda told me that after our first phone conversation, she cried and cried. I made it clear to them that I didn't know whether Devanya Inman was involved or not, but we have one thing in common for sure. We want to know exactly what happened the night Donna Brown was killed. Here's LaShonda. I am actually very, very curious myself as to why, if this man's DNA has matched, why they are insisting on just pushing that under the rug, so to speak. To me, it's almost like the the DA doesn't want to go, oh, no, we made a mistake. You know, if they don't have to admit to their wrongdoing, there's no wrongdoing. She said she recently turned 40, the age of her sister Donna when she died. To know what I've gone through and what she has missed out on, it's just it's not fair. Not over a mere $1,700. It's, it's not fair at all. She said she was horrified that Hercules Brown killed two people with a baseball bat a year after Donna's murder. What kind of sick, twisted person just... At least my sister went quickly, so to speak. At a minimum, LaShonda wants to know for sure who killed her sister, and she said this of Devanya Inman. If this man is innocent, let this man be free. If he was an accomplice to it, he's eaten his crow, so to speak. If he was a part of it, a part of me says, no, do not let this man out. I almost want to believe that he was a part of that. But I also want the actual trigger man to pay his justice. And it's only fair to my sister that it come out. Because unfortunately, the only people that really know is my sister that is no longer here and the man that pulled the trigger. Patsy Carrington feels the same way. I would like for the right person to be charged for her. So how do you do that? Find the right person. First, remember there's no statute of limitations for murder. So you can be charged at the age of 70 for a murder you committed when you were 25. It seems to me the most obvious route would be to reopen the investigation, re-interview the witnesses who said Hercules confessed to them, And if their stories haven't changed after all these years, then you have that testimony plus the DNA evidence. And maybe you'll find something else. So it's time to get cracking. Charge Hercules. Threaten to seek the death penalty. Allow him to get out from under it like he did before. Finger his accomplices. Then we may finally know the true story. I know what we're saying. Charge Hercules with the same crime that Inman was convicted of 17 years ago? The defense would surely have a good time with that. But the prosecution could simply say, we didn't have the DNA evidence at that time. 
and Hercules has already been found guilty of the baseball bat slaughter of two other people. One of Inman's original prosecutors, Tim Edson, says charging Hercules doesn't sound like a bad idea. Was Hercules Brown involved? I don't know, but the DNA being on the mask and everything of that nature in the car, it would seem like that he would be a, a very strong suspect, and I would hope that if he was involved, that they would bring him to justice. The only thing I can say is that if Hercules was involved, and that evidence does need to be presented to the Alapa Judicial Circuit, you know, Dick Perryman, and let him take it from there. I asked Perryman, the district attorney, repeatedly for an interview or a statement. He finally responded just a few days before we recorded this episode. In an emailed statement, he said, While this case was tried long before I took office, there is no evidence that exonerates Devanya Inman. I seek to do justice for all citizens of my district, and should additional evidence allow for prosecution of additional defendants in this or any other case, then we will prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. The victim in this case, Donna Brown, was brutally murdered by Devanya Inman, who was tried and convicted in front of a 12-person jury. We can never forget that we speak for those who cannot speak for themselves." Unquote. You heard that, right? Additional evidence? How much additional evidence do you need? I also got the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to talk about the case, albeit briefly. It was one extremely unsatisfying interview. An agency spokesman, Bain Rich, told me that Donna Brown's case is closed. There's nothing for the Bureau really to make comment about. As you put in your, your email there, they had a motion for new trial several years ago, and that motion was denied. So I don't know. That there's, there's not anything that the Bureau can do. I told him some people had questioned the thoroughness of the GBI's investigation. If they'd done their jobs properly, these folks say, Perhaps William Carroll Bennett and Becky Browning would be alive today. They're the people who were beaten to death by Hercules a year after Donna Brown's murder. So I asked, does the Bureau have any comment on that? No, sir, we don't. You, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, as it is in any case or any, any life situation. Um, but I would just ask you to look at the, the timeline. I would suggest to you just looking at the timeline of when things were taken and when evidence and, and things were examined. A lot of this is, you know, it appears to be, you know, after the fact of things happening. Have you gotten a transcript of the original trial? Have you read it? I've read every page. Okay, good. And of any motions and appeals and all everything, as well? Everything. Okay, good. Very good. Glad to hear that. Uh, but no, sir, there's, there's nothing for us to, to say in regards to it. Rochelle Pfeiffer was William Carroll Bennett's sister. I had a chance to talk with Rochelle and her husband, George, who've been married 60 years, at their home outside Adel. At one point, George stepped out of the front porch to smoke a cigarette, and I went with him. The gnats weren't troubled by the smoke at all. They were all over us a few seconds after we walked outside. I wished I'd had a lighter so maybe I could burn some of them to death. I said to Rochelle, It seems like if they had done a proper investigation of the Taco Bell, I wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah, I know it. It was kept quiet. You didn't hear too much. You didn't, we weren't, like, we weren't told much about it. Because it seemed like, you know, the Taco Bell deal, you know, and then later on, then Hercules and them done what they done. and. George Pfeiffer says he is still at a loss to understand what happened to his brother-in-law. It was unbelievable. It was, I, I never have understood it. Uh, I'm a firm believer in, in God, but I could never understand how God could ever let something like that happen. We heard from one of the original jurors in episode two. I spoke to him at Adele's Dairy Queen. That DQ happens to be right next door to the abandoned Pizza Hut. That's where Donna Brown's Monte Carlo was dumped on the night she died. I still stand by what I, well, the way I voted in the in the trial, with the evidence we got there. There was no, there was, there was not a doubt to me then. I asked the juror what he thought about the revelation of Hercules Brown's DNA being found on the mask. If it's shoddy police work or what, but I mean this, I don't know. But it, uh, it would definitely would have made a difference in the discussion in the jury room. Now, with the mask revelation, things could, I mean, 
He could have been in cahoots with them. And who, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of scenarios there. The juror had told me before that he became convinced of Inman's guilt after hearing Kwame Spaulding's testimony. Spaulding said Inman had confessed in detail to him when they were together in jail. I told the juror that Spaulding later claimed that his testimony was coerced and that Inman never told him any of that stuff. In my mind, that would make him a liar now, and I wouldn't believe anything he said either way. I asked whether he now thinks Inman should have a new trial. Not my decision. I'm not an attorney. I don't know how the, all the rules, but from serving on this jury and hearing the stuff that we didn't get to hear and the evidence that has come about since then, I say yes. It's a man's life in prison out there. If it's the wrong one, let's, let's do everything we can to get him out, and let's do everything we can to get the right ones in. That's where I'm at with it. And I guess I'll, we'll all be judged one day. And, but in my heart, the way I voted, knowing what I knew then, I'm still standing by that. Now, a new trial with the new evidence, and if he comes out not guilty, hallelujah. If that's, if that's the truth. The, the, you know, the truth is a hard thing to find out, you know. But, but with all the evidence and the things that, weren't, that the jury wasn't allowed to hear at the time, it, if it was up to me, yeah, let's do a new trial. Right now, let's do it. Michael Williford and Maida Muhic are the law students who've been working on Inman's case. Since we met them in episode one, they've both graduated from Georgia State's law school and have taken the grueling bar exam. They've also signed up to join big Atlanta law firms in the fall. They recalled one of their visits to interview Inman in prison. One of the things he, he said on one occasion, do you think I'll be home by next Christmas? It was, it was heartbreaking. So you see what you, you imagine is genuine hope for the first time. And, and, and then to know that uh, this process is not that simple. And not only will you not be home by next Christmas, you may never go home, despite people's best efforts to, to draw attention to your case. Again, you know, how you balance that internally, how you deal with, it, it strikes me as, as like the possibility that the a coin flip between heaven and hell. And he's not gonna get too many more opportunities to flip this coin. We used to fight about this quite a bit, me and Mike, mm -hmm. um, because he would always say, you know, he's not gonna be out by Christmas, he may never be out. And I was always like, you need to stop that. The there is hope. And I would literally shut off all conversation. I didn't want to talk about it because Michael was wrong. And at some point I realized that our fight stopped. But then we're going to have come in, made these efforts. Nothing is going to have come from that except my own further disillusionment. We've raised his hopes, ultimately perhaps to only dash them. It's not over yet. If you remember, Jesse Sino, Associate Dean of Georgia State Law School, first brought this case to my attention. She has worked for several years on Inman's behalf. I mean, the, the reality of now, and it's, it's a very sobering reality, is that Devanya's chances, absent a confession from Hercules Brown, and I'm not even sure that that would get him as far as he needs to go, but absent a confession, it is incredibly difficult to find a legal reason to get him back into court. As a lawyer, it's frustrating. As a human being, it keeps me awake at night. I went to law school to help people and there is absolutely nothing that I can do sometimes. And the thing that I love, the law, uh, in so many ways hamstrings us. He's got legal handcuffs in there. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Sino says the DNA evidence alone is enough to warrant a new trial for Inman. It's not that Devanya gets out of jail. It's give the dude a new trial, just a new trial, so that all of this evidence can be properly presented to an impartial jury. This summer, Sino, Williford, and Muhich hooked up with another premier Atlanta law firm, Troutman Sanders which is now taking on the Inman case pro bono. It must have been quite a spectacle. In early July, a parade of lawyers from Atlanta arrived in Adel, at least 15 of them, as well as Troutman summer associates, law students, and support staff. I've not done a barrister census in Adel, but I can't imagine the town has ever seen that many lawyers at once, says Williford. The lawyers from Troutman could have spent that time 
billing clients, uh, doing work that they are certainly going to get paid for. Um, instead, they elected to give up their personal time to go do this for free. Tiffany Bracewell is an associate at Troutman Sanders and a member of Inman's new legal team. She said one focus of the field trip to Adel was to talk to as many of the original trial jurors as possible. We went on a Saturday and a Monday, uh, kind of a targeted attack. We had four or five teams leave Atlanta at five, six in the morning. Um, we had, over the course of two days, we had four jurors who invited us into their homes uh, to speak at varying lengths. Uh, we were able to speak to the jury foreman, and um, we also had three others who indicated they would speak to us. We did learn a few curious details that piqued our interest from an irregularities standpoint. I don't know that we got our silver bullet, but we are looking to go back and speak to a lot of these folks because they've never known about the new developments in the case with Hercules' DNA. So there could be opportunities to, to learn more as people's memories are refreshed and they put some thought into the details. Why such an interest in the jurors? Well, cases can get overturned if there's proof of misconduct involving the jury. And the juror I talked to had certainly said something that piqued my interest. I'm confused about when I heard or maybe how I heard that, but we, or I, just believe that Hercules had already been, he's not here, he, he was, he's had an alibi. And that might have been something I remembered after the trial talking to somebody, or it's been a long time, so, but in my mind it's been like, well, Hercules was, he was out of town, or he had a good alibi for, for that night, but I've since found out that that, that wasn't true. Why would that matter? Well, it depends on when the juror heard the news. There was no testimony at Inman's trial about Hercules Brown having an alibi. None. So if jurors were told that during the trial, outside the courtroom, that would have been improper. It also could possibly give Inman the opening he needs to get back into court. Bracewell said the Troutman lawyers are also trying to speak with Hercules Brown and round up other witnesses. We would love to get something filed, certainly before the end of the year, to, to capitalize on the attention that this case is getting now. At the very least, he deserves a new trial, and um, everyone deserves their fair shake, and he did not get it here. Amy Maxwell puts it this way. Probably a couple times a week, something comes up, and you know somebody's talking about injustice, and I'm thinking, oh, you have no idea about injustice. You don't know about Devanya. And that brings us back to Devanya Inman, who's about to turn 39. I mean, I don't want to be 40 years old in prison. I don't want to be in prison. I don't want to trust nobody anymore. This place is just, it's miserable. And I'm tired of being in prison for something I didn't do. I'm tired of having to prove something that, for something that I didn't do. I want to go home. I want somebody to say, hey, you know, this guy is innocent. And that's it. I just want somebody to apologize for me and just, you know, hey, Free this guy, leave him alone. That's the only thing I asked for. You said if you had any evidence, now what are you gonna do now? And it's like you get the evidence and you don't care. So it's like, what are you what are you a judge for then? I mean, how could you be an honorable judge if you know that somebody is innocent, you still keep them there? It's like what are you being a judge for? What are you there for? Are you there just to convict anybody or is it just me? I asked Inman during our interview what he would like to say to Hercules Brown. Imagine my surprise when he said he'd already seen and spoken with Hercules. The two wound up on a prison bus together, apparently by chance. So we riding this bus going back to the county jail this time. We don't even know that we on the bus together until somebody says our name. This is when we was going back for the motion for new trial. We were on the same bus together. We get up front. And he like, man, I hope you go home, man. I hope you really go home. And that, at least for now, is the end of our story. I have to tell you, it's not a very satisfying end. Devanya Inman may have had everything to do with the murder of Donna Brown, or he may have had nothing to do with it. I wish I could tell you for sure one way or another, but I can't. And I don't believe the state can either. You know, and I know, that the case against Devanya Inman is now in tatters, but his life without parole sentence remains very much intact. 
That's justice below the net line. I sure have enjoyed bringing you another season of this podcast, and I hope you'll rate and review Breakdown on iTunes. We cherish your input. I'm pretty sure the story of Devanya Inman isn't over, and as soon as something breaks, I'll be back. In the meantime, thanks so very much for listening. Breakdown was reported and narrated by Bill Rankin, produced by Richard Hallix. Sound design by Chris Basta of Bare Knuckles Creative. Original Breakdown theme music composed and performed by Bo Emerson and Billy Guin. Additional music composed and performed by Chris Basta and Chris Nicholson, a.k.a. C1 and C2. Special thanks to Kevin Riley, Bert Roten, Monica Richardson, Bo Emerson, Melanie Stolte, and all the great folks at the AJC, Buddy Hall, Chris Nicholson, Jesse Sino, Michael Williford, Maida Muhich, and Lynn Taylor. <laughs> <laughs>